Right on. So uh, we are, by the way, I, I see comments in the chat, no sound and all that good stuff. So I hear, I see, we can hear Brent, but we can't hear Adam. <laughs> exactly let's see uh there's my audio it's back thank you everybody for that thank you sadly that means they missed your whole introduction oh man and i you know i gotta tell everybody here i think this was my best intro yet i was witty i was <laughs> funny like i really was feeling good so for those of you that missed it i'm really sorry but <laughs> Maybe tomorrow I'll I'll try to start out with a better one. Anyways, Brent, I please know. go on. That that means they missed out the they missed out on the free AWS credit code that <laughs> you spoke. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, all right, so we are we are going to be uh, running through parts of EKS Workshop this week, and um, we're going to start off with most of most of. Mostly we're gonna limit ourselves to the uh, beginner level uh, stuff. So we're gonna start off talking about the introduction where we talk about just what is Kubernetes? How does it work? What do we do? And uh, then we're gonna dive into building a cluster. Then we're gonna, we're gonna move on to, to hopefully today, uh, deploying our very first container. Um, so, That'll be, that's the goal for today. We'll see how far we get. If I get long winded, then maybe we don't quite get there, but uh, come back tomorrow if that's the case. We're gonna be here all week and we're gonna be uh, doing this live all week. So uh, definitely plan to uh, join us. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, it's a great lunch and learn opportunity. If you're on the East Coast, um, you know, it's it's kind of like a nap time situation. So you can feel free to, you know, take a mental break from work for a bit and, uh, you know, tune into us and, and ask questions in chat, you know, take advantage of the time and uh, we'll be like just slowly uh, churning through this stuff. So without further ado, let's talk uh, containers and Kubernetes. So we start off just, you know, we, we started last week talking about containers and ECS and orchestrating your containers using ECS. And we kind of touched on it a bit, but let's reiterate, what is orchestration? If you think about it, orchestration is necessary once you start to have a certain level of scale. When you break a monolith down into microservices, you go from managing one application to managing a set of applications. So that set of applications could be, you know, two, three, or four, four additional apps, or it could be a dozen or more additional uh, processes. When they're all running on a single uh, server, they're still pretty easy to manage, you know, even if you're managing them by hand or if you're using traditional um, operations tools like Puppet or Chef. But once you start to get into the dozens to, to hundreds of applications that you have to manage, it starts to become unwieldy to do it the, the traditional way, assigning, you know, a node, a certain uh, type, and then saying any, like you might say, this set of servers, this is my web tier. And my web nodes all need to have these seven containers running on them. I mean, that's great and it certainly works, but it's pretty limited. It's, it's taking the perspective of uh, still tying applications to instances. So at that point, by moving to Docker, really the only advantage you're taking advantage of or the only thing that you're uh, gaining by is you're, you have better packaging for your applications. And that's certainly worth worthwhile, but you could still have more. So in addition to better packaging, being able to more easily install an app, so to speak, um, we could actually... Uh, also take advantage of the ability to shift applications around 
and uh, you know, kind of balance them and place them uh, where they'll fit better so we can get better efficiency of our resources. So instead of thinking about your infrastructure in terms of I have web servers, I have database servers, I have uh, cache servers and, and all these other types of servers. Instead, you start thinking of in terms of, I have web apps, I have cache apps, and I have database apps, and I need those to all be running somewhere in my fleet of servers. Kubernetes and other container orchestrators, these just give us a way to group together our servers into a pool of resources, a big pool of resources that we can then launch our processes out onto. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator and it works by allowing us to declare what is the end state that we want and then it uses its own built-in logic to get to that state. So if you think about for a second, Puppet, Chef, et cetera, uh, those are great because they give you a unified language that you can type instructions uh, you know, in. And you can say, I need to be able to install package A, then package B and package C. Then I need to be able to execute command, whatever, and then you know, grow uh, a hard drive to a certain size. And you, you give this list of step-by-step -step instructions that have to occur. We don't do that with Kubernetes. We don't do that with any container orchestrator. What we do instead is we describe, boom, this is what it should look like when you're done. And the orchestrator figures out how to get there. It looks at what do I have right now? And what do I need to do? What are the steps that I need to take to get there? So it's not up to me to decide what those steps are. And I think that's really cool. It's sort of the next level of operational excellence. So um, definitely uh, it's worth uh, exploring in a little bit more detail. Now we're gonna be talking about a little bit about Kubernetes, uh, but also we're gonna be talking about EKS. And I might occasionally use those terms interchangeably. So let's talk real quick about what is EKS. EKS is Amazon's Kubernetes service, the Elastic Kubernetes service. And what this is, is we had a lot of customers running Kubernetes on AWS. And just like many other uh, opportunities, we see, you know, we can make this easier for our customers. We can take the heavy lifting away, the, the operational overhead, we can take that off your hands so that you don't have to worry about that anymore. And uh, once you start to see, you know, if one person is doing something over and over and over again, um, you know, great. Uh, they're going to get really good at it. But if a thousand people or 10,000 people or a hundred thousand people start to do the exact same thing, at that point, we should look at doing it for you. We should, you know, if, if we're going to be obsessed about our customers and, and uh, you know, helping them on their journey, then we should start looking at those opportunities and doing that for you. So that's what we did when we launched EKS. We actually um, uh, saw that a bunch of customers were uh, running Kubernetes on their own, DIY style. They were struggling a bit with managing the control plane and managing upgrades and all that stuff. And we said, you know, if we just focus, we can probably solve this problem for all of our customers at scale. And so we launched the, the EKS service uh, to be able to answer that challenge. Hey, Brent. So. Yeah. So can we, can, can you talk a little bit more to that point of, you know, so I, I, we come from a background of, you know, previous to having this managed, you know, system for us of, of managing our own orchestration platforms. Can you maybe talk to some of the, the pain points that come with that? Can we, just at a high oh, level? Yeah. I mean, just, if you've ever done it, just think about what you have to go through to upgrade a cluster. Like, let's just start there. Um, upgrading a cluster is not a trivial thing. You don't just, uh, you know, type a command or, 
yum-y upgrade or anything like that because it's not just one process that's running. It's actually a, a, an entire collection of processes that are running and they all have to be kind of orchestrated themselves and upgraded in a particular order. And we have to make sure that one is healthy before we move on to the next. Um, so it can be a challenge, uh, quite a challenge. And being able to perfect that process is something that you know you don't have a lot of opportunity to do. If you think about it, uh, Kubernetes is a project that, that cuts a release every uh, three or four months. And so that gives you, you know, three or four times a year that you get the ability to go through the upgrade process and figure out what do I need to do? And once you've gone through it, then you're just so like <sighs> relieved that everything worked. You don't want to go back through it again and, and hone and tweak, or at least not many of you do. So you're just like, I'll, I'll uh, tweak it a little bit more in three or four months. Um, so that's just one example of a challenge of running, uh, you know, the, uh, the, contr the control plane tier of applications yourselves. Uh, just stop and think, what version, you know, did I start on? How many upgrades have I done? If a new version were to drop today, how would that change my timeline? You know, what would I have to do? Would I drop all my work or would I just be like, oh, yeah, okay, I can take care of that, you know, in a few minutes. Um, we want it to be so easy that it can just be taken care of in a few minutes and you don't have to think about it. Um, customers, you know, before EKS didn't really have that, pro that uh, luxury. They would plan, you know, uh, elaborate maintenance windows, and they would have to figure out when am I going to do this upgrade? You know, a different scenario is if one of your nodes dies, you know, how do you troubleshoot? How do you fix it? Uh, or if one of the services that's running on the control plane dies, uh, how do you detect it, troubleshoot it, fix it? So these are all things that, you know, you have to be good at to be a good Kubernetes administrator um, and so, you know, we, we want to be able to assist uh, in, the, in that, those areas and then let you focus on deploying and running and scaling your own applications. Definitely. Ho hopefully that helps answer the question. Yep. Thanks, Brent. Cool. Okay. So uh, Kubernetes, we're going to take a look just at a real basic walkthrough of Kubernetes and how it's laid out. And then we're going to get into EKS and, and how that uh, works. So what is Kubernetes? I've kind of uh, alluded to it already or said it outright. Uh, it is an open source container management platform. And by the way, if I didn't say this before, you can see all of this material at eksworkshop.com. Um, I'm just stepping through the intro section of the website right now. So you can watch it on screen now, but if you want to share this later, uh, you can share the videos or uh, send around the, the workshop link. Uh, it's out there and publicly available and free for you to use. So what does an open source container management platform do? Well, it helps you run containers at scale. Um, and then it provides objects and APIs for building modern applications. So let's take this first box real quick and let's just break it down. Uh, open source. If I was going to emphasize anything here, it's open source. And then container management platform is secondary to that. I think that, uh, you know, people use Kubernetes because they want to manage containers, but also they pick Kubernetes because it's open source. Now that brings a couple of features to the table. One, they can see the code, validate the code, and modify the code. And that's hugely valuable to a lot of people, especially the developer-minded people. But two, it also gives us the ability to run virtually anywhere. So uh, I get asked a lot of times, what should I use? Should I use ECS or should I use Kubernetes or EKS? And my answer is always the same. It starts off with a question back and that is, well, are you all in on Amazon? And if you're all in on Amazon, then you might consider ECS. But think about the other scenario. 
if you're not all in on Amazon, you're, you perhaps have to manage compute in a data center, uh, manage compute um, in your office, uh, plus then also some compute on Amazon. Um, what do you do then? Uh, you, you know, you're used to having at AWS all of these super nice APIs to be able to bring stuff up, take stuff down. Um, so that's really, that's really great. You don't, a lot of times you don't have that in, a, in your own data center. You just have some bare metal that you have to, you have to go and like touch and, you know, who wants to do that? Um, so Kubernetes actually gives us a consistent API everywhere that we run it. So we can choose to run in run Kubernetes in AWS plus run Kubernetes in our data center, and we can basically build the same experience in both places. So we can then start to write code, train our operators, train our developers uh, to have the same set of expectations everywhere. Also, one cool thing about Kubernetes is that it can scale down to be very, very tiny. So even though we'll be talking about it in terms of running it in production, uh, where you have you know multiple uh, control plane nodes, you have uh, you know uh, recovery from failure and stuff like that, lots of redundancies, you can actually scale it down so far that you can run it on your laptop. Uh, people run it on Raspberry Pis. So because it can scale down that small it's great for a developer environment. So if you think about it, you can have the same experience as a developer uh, going from a dev environment all the way through to QA or staging or whatever your, your company calls that, all the way to production. It can be the same set of APIs and the same experience and the same uh, operational um, procedures. So uh, that's one of the gr best parts of this being an open source platform is that level of, of functionality can be built in. So let's talk about the nodes, the nodes that, uh, that you'll have to run if you're running Kubernetes, and then we'll break that, we'll uh, show you what will be running for you when you run EKS. So the machines that make up Kubernetes, they're called nodes. The nodes meaning instances, uh, you could, that would be the equivalent of an EC2 instance in AWS lingo. Um, they may be physical or they may be virtual. You can run bare metal, you can run VMware um, instances, you can run EC2 instances, etc. They break down into two classifications, the control plane node and the worker node. I'm gonna leave it up to you to guess which does which. So uh, no, I'll explain it. The control plane node is where uh, all of the decision-making goes. That's where all of the administrative processes get run. And then the worker node, that's, that's where your applications to, uh, will execute. So when you want to launch your application out onto Kubernetes, you're gonna launch the data plane nodes to handle that compute. The worker nodes, on the other hand, are just going to handle uh, scheduling those applications to run, uh, locating those resources for those applications, um, detecting when they're healthy or unhealthy and routing traffic to them, and all that stuff. Now, Kubernetes, one of the cool things about it is its, uh, its API and its object-oriented nature. So um, Kubernetes objects are just entities that are used to represent the state of a cluster. So remember, I said, we don't describe the step-by-step -step path to get to where we want to go. We just describe the end state. And we do that by describing uh, these objects and what we expect to see when everything is perfect. So an object is simply a record of intent. Once it's created, the cluster does its best to ensure that it exists as defined, and this is known as the cluster's desired state. So we might say, I need a deployment of application A, and that, that deployment is an object. So um, I can actually just describe that to the Kubernetes uh, control plane, and then it will do whatever it needs to do. It'll figure out all the steps necessary to get me that deployment. And then once it has it, 
it'll sit back and say, this is perfect and everything will look healthy. And then if anything should come along to change the way that deployment looks, the control plane will notice and it will do whatever corrective measure it needs uh, to correct the situation to get it back to being perfect. So all we do is we describe the end state to Kubernetes. Um, so here's what we can describe. Uh, what pods are running on which nodes, uh, any IP endpoints that map to a logical group of containers, how many replicas of a container we might be running, and there are more. Okay, so some of the objects. Uh, pod. This is probably, you could think of this as being the, the smallest unit of measure in the Kubernetes space. Uh, it is simply uh, the description of how to run one or more containers. Last week, we were talking ECS, and we talked about tasks. This is the Kubernetes equivalent. This is the pod. In a pod, you might start off thinking one pod, one container. It doesn't have to be that way. That is definitely the most common thing to see, but it's not the, the only thing that you'll see. Uh, a lot of times, you'll see a pod... Uh, that includes a couple of containers. One, one may be your application code, and another one may be your sidecar. Um, a sidecar might be used to uh, send logs wherever uh, you need those to go. Uh, one might be used to collect metrics. You might even have your application container plus a log container plus a metrics container. Now you have three, uh, three containers in a single pod. What's great about a pod is they actually share uh, compute together. They always go out together. They're always uh, running together. And when you kill them, uh, they go away together. And they also share uh, a network interface so they can talk to each other over localhost. So that's really handy too. When you're thinking about, should I put this in a pod, in the same pod, or should I uh, make it a separate pod, just ask yourself, when I deploy them, how do I scale them? Do I scale them together always, or do I scale them independently? When I'm scaling them independently, they need their own pods. When I always scale them together, they should all be in one pod together. A daemon set is another kind of deployment. Uh, and what this does is it implements a single instance of a pod on every worker node. And you can filter and say, you know, like only, only worker nodes that include GPUs should have this kind of uh, daemon set running. Um, only worker nodes tagged with a certain uh, tag should get this daemon set. But for the most part, think of it as uh, I have a collection of instances, EC2 instances, compute, whatever it is, collection of compute, and I always want one copy of this pod running on all of those, each of those. So a lot of people do use this for uh, Splunk forwarding or whatever other log aggregation or X-ray uh, collection or uh, you know anything that you, that you need to be installed at the instance level, uh, install it with a daemon set. It's much easier. A deployment details how to roll out or roll back across versions of your application. So a deployment, is, it describes how should this go out. And you might say, well, you know, why, why does that matter? Everything should go out the same way. Well, not really. There are cases where deployments uh, need, you need to think about how does this go out versus a different application. And I'll give you one, um, one good example of this. If it's a web application, yeah, just, you know, like add more, contract the old version, add more, contract the old version until you're fully ro rolled out. That's perfectly fine. But if let's say instead you're talking about a Kafka consumer, you know, every time you add a Kafka consumer to a topic, it rebalances, right? Um, imagine if you were doing that incremental add and incremental subtract you would be rebalancing the entire time span of the deployment. And that might be many minutes. So that might put you very far behind consuming whatever you're, you're pumping into that topic. 
So instead, uh, you know, you might for a Kafka topic or a Kafka consumer consider uh, completely kill the old version and completely start the new version all at the same time. And that way you're minimizing the rebalance time. So that's just two examples of when you might choose different deployment styles. Um, but anyway, getting to choose that is, is really handy. What else do we have? Replica set, uh, ensure a defined number of pods are always running. It, when you're in production, you will probably never want only one of something running uh, if you're sending live traffic to it. So uh, you can define with a replica set, I want three running or I want seven or 37 running. Um, a job is a process that uh, it starts, runs, and then once it's complete, it goes away. So I like to think of jobs in terms of cron jobs. Uh, people use, use um, the job object as a distributed cron all the time. Service, uh, this is how we can actually create an IP address and map it to a logical group of pods. So I might have a front end web application and I'll create a service that fronts those uh, pods. So that's how, Everything that needs to send traffic to my front end application talks to my front end service. And then the traffic gets routed inward to the pods wherever they happen to be running. And as those pods come and go, and, and as they move around, uh, that mapping is constantly being kept up to date so that the traffic can be routed uh, to the appropriate pod. A label is a key value pair. and it's usually used for association or for filtering. You can use it for all kinds of stuff, but that, that's a pretty common use case. So let's take a, a look real quick at the architecture of Kubernetes. So this is a logical view of the architecture and these these yellow boxes, you can think of uh, those as being, well, in fact, they're labeled, the control plane and a worker. So these are all of the parts that are running in each location. Now, the orange box is cube control, and then the green box is the internet. So think of cube control as being, if you're the operator of Kubernetes, this is you, this is where you're sitting. And then the internet, that's the traffic that's gonna be coming into you, uh, you know, hitting the applications that, that you're running. So let's take a closer look at just the control plane bits real quick. So again, orange box, uh, you using the cube control command, um, it's always talking to the API server. So there's a process uh, running on the control plane called the API server, the API process. And that is the thing that cube control always talks to. So then elsewhere running on the control plane, we have a control, controller manager and we have a scheduler, and then we have our state store etcd. etcd is just a distributed key value database. Uh, it's equivalent in a lot of ways to Zookeeper uh, in Mesos or console uh, from HashiCorp, uh, distributed key value. Um, so this is, where we, this is where the API server will write all of its information uh, so that if anything ever goes wrong and we need to read what is the current state of the cluster, we'll have all of that data stored. So cube control only ever talks to the API server, and then the API server can reach out and queue up information or talk to Kubelet. So that's, that's our path to get to the worker. Notice it's off the control plane. We'll take a look then at the worker. And, and Brent, you know, I know we're, we're going to be doing more with cube control in the workshop, but I, I think mm -hmm. maybe just a, even a high level of what are some of the benefits of using cube, cube control? What are you doing with it? Totally. Oh, this is actually a good, uh, good topic. I love uh, and by the way, I say cube control. Some people say cube cuddle. I've heard all kinds of crazy pronunciations, uh, but for me, it's cube control. Hopefully that doesn't offend our audience. Um, but what is cube control? It's basically a wrapper around the Kubernetes API. So if there is an API call that you can make, 
then there is a cube control command that you can execute to make that call. And I think that's awesome. Uh, so instead of having to formulate a curl and like have the right authorization headers in place and, and, you know, understand when you need to get versus when you need to post, um, and all that stuff to talk to an API, you can just run a command, you know, just, uh, bang it out, run it. And, uh, you've executed an API call at that point. So it's, it's really cool. And if you ever then want to explore what functionality do I have in cube control, uh, start exploring the Kubernetes API. That'll really get you a long way to figuring out what can I do with cube control. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, also, cube control, the format is, is like, it's pretty cool once you realize that the, you know, you have the command, cube control, and then you have a second word. That second word is always a verb. Your cube control get, cube control describe, uh, you know, it's always a verb. And so that can, that can really help lock in the command structure for executing whatever API call it is that you're trying to execute. So just figure out what it, you know, what am I trying to do? That's your verb. And then what object am I trying to do it to? That's tends to be the third word. And uh, from there, you just start filling in details after that. So um, that's, that's how you use cube control. It's, it's really simple. Okay, so we were back on the, work, on the control plane. Let me run back here real quick. And I was, I was talking about Kubelet and I was pointing out that it was off the box, right? Well, that's because if we look over here on the data plane, it's running on the worker. So that's how the, the control plane connects to the data plane is by the control plane API server and kubelet communicating with each other. So that's why we see the API process here communicating with kubelet. So kubelet, you could think of this as being a Kubernetes agent. So this is what is running on all workers and this is how they uh, connect to the API to figure out what they need to do. Um, so let's say we need to queue up a deployment of our front end web application. Uh, you know, the scheduler decides where the resources are that are available and it decides where this uh, pod should be scheduled. So it then writes to the API and says, schedule it on, on worker one. And uh, the API process then queues up an action for worker one. And as soon as worker one checks in uh, with the API process, it sees I have an action and it goes ahead and uh, executes that action. And so worker one uh, is executing all of the appropriate commands to launch my front end API. So where are we now? We have kubelet, where does it write or where does it control? That is what launches pods for us. So in this particular diagram, excuse me, we see that we're launching a couple of pods. We're using the Docker daemon to do that. But we also have this other thing over here, cube proxy. Well, remember in our big diagram, there was, there was you, the operator, uh, running cube control commands, but then there was also the internet. So let's pretend for a second that I'm, I'm launching my front end web application and that's we're expecting to, to receive traffic from the internet. That traffic has to get routed to the appropriate container and those containers can be running on any worker but also on any port uh, on that worker. So we dynamically assign ports uh, to be able to fit containers uh, into uh, the workers. So we don't all, you know, if we, if we were sticking with static ports and you launched a container that took up port 8080, well now I would have to uh, schedule the second copy of that running somewhere else because port 8080 is taken. If on the other hand, we just say, you know, give me any available port, now I can run as many copies of that as I need to be able to answer requests and I can spread that out wherever it'll fit in my compute fleet. So anyway, kube proxy is how the traffic gets routed inward 
to talk to whatever the appropriate container is. So the traffic comes in from the internet, it hits Cube Proxy. Cube Proxy knows everything that's running on this worker and knows that this traffic is destined for my front end and it sends it to that container. How are we doing with questions? All good. Sweet. I'm just All answering right. in the chat. So we're just nice. chatting in the chat. All is good. All right. So let's talk about Kubernetes cluster setup. Uh, if you're, if you're going to build Kubernetes yourself, you have options. Uh, Minikube is certainly a great option. It's great for development and learning, teaching yourself Kubernetes. If you want to build out, uh, you know, a, a DIY cluster, uh, COPS can help you do that. So you can launch, for example, you can launch on EC2 instances in AWS. Uh, Cube ADM will help you build out a Kubernetes cluster also good for learning, development, and production. And then there's Docker for Mac, which is Docker desktop running on your Mac. It actually is running inside a virtual machine, but it does a really good job of, of sort of hiding that fact from you. And it makes you feel like you're running your container in the Mac OS. Um, so it's really cool if you have if you do have a Mac. There's also Kind. Uh, this is spelled out Kubernetes in Docker, uh, but you'll see it often referred to elsewhere as Kind. Uh, so you can definitely check that out for learning. Now let's talk about EKS. So we've been talking about Kubernetes and everything that we've talked about so far in that little intro is how Kubernetes works everywhere. Um, but let's talk about what are the specifics with EKS. And Brent, a question so, did come in. Yeah. Uh, just around uh, Kube Proxy, uh, the question mm -hmm. was just, is Kube Proxy bound to a specific port on the worker? Yeah, it is. Good question. So what you tend to do is you have Kube Proxy take up uh, a port or two or three or four, whatever you need it to take up. And it will be the owner of the official port for that service. And then it'll route the traffic from there to whatever randomly assigned port that the container's actually located at. Uh, but that way you can have you know, one process sitting there owning the one copy of the port that you have or that you have available on that one worker. So that's how we're able to sort of scale uh, port addresses. Hopefully that answers your question. Cool. <clears throat> OK, so EKS creation cluster workflow. Now, if you, th I like to describe this because I like to describe what this one bullet point actually encompasses. So what we're doing is we're reducing building the cluster down to one bullet point. And then everything else is the same, whether you're doing a DIY cluster or you're running EKS. So creating an EKS cluster is, uh, for us, simply running a command for EKS. But if you think about what do you have to do for uh, building a DIY cluster, go back you know, a couple of those slides and look at COPS or look at uh, any of those production level uh, processes, and you'll spend a long time building your control plane. You have to bring up control plane nodes. You have to bring up, ideally for production separately, etcd nodes. The etcd nodes need to, uh, you know, network, talk to each other, and build a quorum. Then your control plane nodes can start using the etcd nodes, and they can start to uh, bring up all of their processes, um, including the API server, the scheduler, and, and all the other ones that we were looking at. So only then are you ready to actually add worker nodes. So that process can take you know, a very, very long time. Um, we boil it down for us, for you, uh, we boil it down to a single bullet point launching an EKS cluster. And that's what we're doing for you uh, behind the scenes. And, you, you know, I think it's important to talk about that separation of etcd from uh, the, the uh, control plane nodes, you know, because what happens if you run them on the, the same, same nodes? And what happens if all your nodes go down? Yeah. <laughs> Where, where's your state oh, exactly. of your cluster? Exactly. So, 
Yeah. So if you if you run uh, etcd, you know, completely independently, then you're protecting yourself from, uh, you know, getting into some kind of weird I/O contention uh, where you know. I've seen clusters even uh, get deadlocked where I make an API call and it's trying to write to the database that's running on the same uh, you know, nodes. And because, because the write is so intense and so heavy and so repetitive, uh, I can't uh, give back the result of the API call. Um, and so that ends up creating this API storm uh, that you know, just continues to send, uh, you know, uh, retries and keeping those things separated gives you a fighting chance at uh, recovering from that kind of situation. Now, it doesn't make the situation go away. It doesn't uh, eliminate the possibilities there. There's definitely other things that you want to do to safeguard, but it's at least one massive step uh, in the right direction. So, uh, if you're ever building a cluster for production, definitely consider splitting out your etcd nodes. Uh, I see that question. Is there a threshold as to how far the actual state can be from the desired state? The desired state is always something that we're trying to attain. So I don't know about a threshold necessarily, but I can tell you one situation that comes to mind is if we're trying to, for example, do a deployment um, and that deployment you know, it requires that we schedule pods based on certain, the availability of certain resources. Um, if we're out of resources, then that deployment is just gonna sit there and, and wait and wait and wait and wait in infinitely. So uh, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a threshold, but that's, that's a situation where the, actu the actual state will never reach the desired state until there's some kind of intervention. And the intervention would be to add resources. So, and we, in the workshop, we'll actually get into uh, automatically adding those resources using auto scaling. But that's a great, uh, great example of, you know, we'll do, it, it will do everything that it can do, but there will be times when it just can't do enough. And so that's when intervention uh, has to occur. So I said single dot create cluster. What does that boil down to? Well, that's really us creating an HA control plane, uh, creating the IAM integration. We'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, building out certificate management for you and then setting up a load balancer. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about the load balancer here in a second. Uh, maybe even right now. So... <laughs> So what is the load balancer and how does all of this communicate together? Um, when you look at the EKS cluster that you've built, uh, you actually won't see control plane nodes. Um, what you might see if you really start to look around though, is you might see some ENIs uh, that are attached to a different uh, VPC or a different network. Um, they're attached to your network, but they're also then allowing traffic from a different network. Here's how EKS is built. The blue box, that is, think of that as your account and your VPC. And then the orange box, think of that as our account and our VPC. So we have a VPC where we are bringing up the control plane nodes. We are bringing up etcd. We are bringing up all the correct, all the right things. And then what we do is we provision ENIs into your VPC. When you build EKS, you target a VPC that's in your account. That's where we'll drop in some ENIs for you. And that's how our control plane nodes talk to your worker nodes. So they're, they're, they appear to all be on the same network. However, they're actually doing cross account ENI uh, connectivity. And, for, and then as far as the reverse traffic goes, uh, the reverse traffic is when a, the API needs to talk back to the control plane, Kubelet needs to check in with the API. That happens over a network load balancer. So this is the load balancer in the last slide that we're referring to. We provision a load balancer that has an IP address that then your worker nodes 
uh, know to reach out and talk to. And that traffic gets routed to uh, the API process on the control plane. Yeah, there's just, some... there's just talk of ENIs. So I just think it's for those who maybe aren't super oh. savvy with AWS terminology. You know, Good call. What is an ENI? Yeah, so it's an elastic network interface, right? So this is a way to expose a service or a resource um, in, in your in your network, in your virtual private cloud. So VPC is a virtual private cloud. That's your logical network uh, where you, in this case, would run your um, worker nodes, but then you're sharing that with the, the virtual private cloud from, well, not sharing, but they're talking to each other from the control plane. It's virtual private cloud to your virtual private cloud. Awesome. So I just wanted to touch Bingo. on that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So high level, what's happening? You're executing cube control. You're sitting here running your cube control commands and you're firing those at the API process. And that is running, you know, at AWS, EKS. It's, uh, t you're talking to whatever your cluster is, dot EKS, dot Amazon, AWS.com. So we are, we are running that control plane for you and we are presenting the API to you. Um, your workers are then running in your own private VPC and they are checking in to the same API, the same API process. So you can reach it from where you are running cube control. They can reach it from where they are inside their VPC. All right, so that's the lowdown of, of 